Daniel 7 and 8 detail the short but brutal career of the Little Horn, the Antichrist. And in this video, we will discuss when it begins and what he does. After Daniel received these visions, he was shaken and sick for days. In the same way, we should soberly consider them, but with confidence that Jesus will triumph in the end. This is the final video in the series on Daniel 7. It began with this video about the fourth terrifying beast. If you haven't seen it yet, click on the banner and begin the series there. The second video in this series is called The Four Beasts or the Four Horns. Again, if you haven't watched this video, click on the banner so you can catch up and be ready for this video. And the third video detailed the rise of a little horn, the Antichrist, and in it, we determined what nations would be the ten horns. A critical but overlooked point is that the Antichrist arises only after the ten horns are established, not before. When I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, Daniel 7, 8. First, the little horn is a minor horn at first. This seems to eliminate all the candidates who are major horns already, like Trump, Marcon, and the Pope, from being the Antichrist. It is most likely the Antichrist is someone from the Middle East that, as of right now, has never made the news, but will arise after the Ten Horns are established. It is after this that we learn something incredible, something that allows us to time all of these events. Daniel's vision takes him into the throne room of God. As I look, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. How does this allow us to time the rise of the little horn? This may not seem like a familiar scene to most, but these two verses in Daniel about God's throne room are the exact same events as found in and expanded upon in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. In Daniel, there are two verses. In Revelation, two chapters. In Daniel, the prophet saw the vision. In Revelation, it was John. But there are an amazing five exact similarities between these sections of Scripture. And we're going to look at them in a second. What makes this a key time stamp? is that the vision in Revelation occurs prior to the opening of a seven-sealed scroll, which is acknowledged by most as the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. So if this vision is the same as the one in Daniel, then everything that happens in Daniel 7 and 8 prior to this vision also occurs prior to the 70th week. This is a key insight and one of the most significant time markers in the career of the Little Horn. Again, if the vision of the throne room is the beginning of the 70th week, everything in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 before that are before the 70th week. So this means that the events we learned about in the last video, the war between the ram and the goat, Iran and Turkey, and the formation of the four beasts from the breakup of the goat, and the little horn plucking out three of the horns to reform the four into a single kingdom again, all of these things take place before the thrones are placed in heaven and then before judgment begins and before the 70th week. Wow, I'm sure this video series in Daniel has been quite a ride and this last revelation has probably been the most earth-shaking of all. So let's look at the scriptures and find those five similarities that show Daniel 7, 9 through 10 are the same as Revelation 4 through 5. There are five of these similarities. First, the thrones are placed. Daniel 7, 9, as I looked, thrones were placed. Revelation 4, 4, around the throne 
were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting. Second, the Lord upon his throne. Daniel 7, 9, the Ancient of Days took his seat. Revelation 4, 2 through 3, a throne was standing in heaven, and one seated upon the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. Third, the appearance of the throne. Daniel 7, 9 through 10. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. And in Revelation 4, 5, out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. His attendants, fourth. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. In Daniel 7, 10. Revelation 5, many angels around the thrones and living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. This number, thousands of thousands and myriads of myriads, is an exact quote in the Greek and identical between the two passages. And direct quotes are one way the Bible shows the two things are the same. And fifth, the books were opened in Daniel 7, and the seven-sealed scroll is opened in Revelation. So this five fingerprint similarities show that Daniel and John saw the same vision. Now when we read the books were opened, the seven-sealed scroll was only one of these books. What exactly are these books or scrolls? They are opened in relation to the first resurrection that takes place after the sixth seal. The same books are opened at the second resurrection as well, and we read about them in Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 12 through 15. So a book of deeds or what a person has done in their life is opened and the book of life. These are the books that are opened and all men are judged by them. The dead who are written in the book of life are resurrected at this point during the 70th week of Daniel and they are caught up into the air with the living written in the book of life. That would be the rapture. Now, according to Jewish custom, three books are opened on Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, and then closed on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Book of the Righteous, the Book of the Unrighteous, and the Book of those in between. If a man is deemed in between, judgment is delayed from Yom Teruah, which is Rosh Hashanah, to Yom Kippur. It is during that period of time that a man is given opportunity to repent before the book is closed and his destiny is sealed. So the books are opened on the Feast of Trumpet to begin the 70th week. This idea of being in between is just like what was said to the church of Laodicea. They were neither cold, unrighteous, nor hot, righteous, but they were lukewarm or in between. So Daniel and John were observing the very same events in similar visions, but yet lived 600 years apart. We've just seen an exact fingerprint similarity of Daniel 7, 9 through 10 with Revelation 4 through 6. And by the way, this wasn't the only vision that Daniel and John both saw. We will get to these other visions in another video. But the importance of these visions being the same is that the 70th week and the opening of the seven sealed scroll happens after all the commotion in the Gentile nations that takes place in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. For instance, the goat overcoming the ram and then splitting into the four beasts or four horns. The rising of the ten horns at that same time and then the rising of a little horn amongst the ten horns and on one of the horns of the goat. 
It is only at this point that the 70th week begins. Now Jesus alluded to this in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the fig tree and all the trees. Behold the fig tree, Israel, and all the trees, the Gentile nations round about. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. Now Mark and Matthew's parallel accounts mention only the fig tree. So most have seen Israel become a nation in 1948 and think that time could be here. But all the trees need to be in place for the 70th week to begin. Israel is already sprouting leaves, but the Gentile nations need to undergo the commotion we talked about first. Then the 70th week is about to begin. One of the first things the little horn does after the beginning of the 70th week is to attempt to consolidate his kingdom. Daniel 11 speaks of an end time war between the king of the north and the king of the south. These are the particulars of the little horn's military campaign to consolidate his kingdom. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him and the king of the north will storm against him that is, the king of the south, with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. Daniel 11:40. Let's look at our map and see how this might play out. If you remember from our last video, the little horn plucked out three of the four horns, or kings, and replaced them with puppet leaders under his control. But this is only four of the ten horns. He wants to consolidate all of them. Let's return to our map of the Ten Horns to see what this might mean. By intrigue, the Little Horn has acquired influence over the entire area that was the Goat Kingdom, the area that's colored purple, green, red, and yellow. This area is also similar to the ancient Seleucid Empire that formed during the Wars of the Diadochi after Alexander the Great's death. In the Bible, the rulers of this region were known as the Kings of the North. These kings of the north were in opposition to the other major kingdom that formed out of Alexander's realm, the Ptolemaic kingdom, the kings of the south. And Daniel 11, 40 through 41 that we just looked at tells us these ancient wars will repeat in the end times and that the Antichrist will ultimately triumph. Who are these kings of the south? Looking at the map, there are five northern horns and five southern horns. Might the southern horns act as one to oppose the aggression of the little horn and become the kings of the south? Maybe. And look what the Bible says about this war. Let's take it apart and look at it one piece at a time. First, the text says the king of the north, or the little horn, will enter Israel, the beautiful land, and that many countries will fall. But this text shows who doesn't originally fall. Edom, Moab, and Ammon, which collectively most scholars believe is Jordan. And we continue to read that he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and Ethiopians, although the correct Hebrew term here is Cush, which is Sudan, will follow at his heels. Daniel 11, 41 through 43. We can see that Egypt then Libya, then the Sudan, all fall to the Antichrist. Again, four of the five southern horns of the Ten Kingdom Confederacy were mentioned in just these couple verses. And that really provides us with confirmation that we are on the right track in terms of the identity of the Ten Horns. However, the passage is very interesting because we learn for a period of time Jordan will remain outside of Antichrist control and Saudi Arabia is not mentioned directly at all. However, we know at some point, which is probably the abomination of desolation that happens at the midpoint of the seven years, all ten horns will give their power to the Antichrist. The ten horns which you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. Revelation 17, 12 through 13. 
So we know that the Antichrist will consolidate and control all ten horns of this region. But the Middle East is only one portion of the world. What occurs elsewhere? I'm sure you're wondering. We learn he will destroy to an extraordinary degree, but his power is not his own. In Daniel 11, we read a very similar passage. We learn he will take action against the strongest fortresses, that could be Western nations, with the help of a foreign god. Who is this? Most likely it is the demon beast that possesses him that we learned about in the first video in this series. People in Western nations believe they may be safe and secure behind their military might. But both of these passages indicate that the Antichrist will be powerful because of the demonic power that possesses him, not due to his own ability or resources. Israel and the USA may think they're safe, but they are not. Supernatural power trumps earthly power. Western nations are in for a rude shock. The passage in Daniel 11 also shows the Antichrist will hand out favors to those who help him, selling land that he acquires through victory and honoring those on his side. So in addition to help from demons, he will have help from earthly forces. How might this be? Now we can only speculate. Islamic writings tell us that they expect a man to arise in the end times named Esau. Muslims believe he will say he is the historic Jesus returned to earth. He will announce that Judgment Day has come, and he will call all Muslims, both radical and moderate, to rise up in worldwide jihad. Eerily, Jesus speaks of something very similar. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. Jesus warns us that false prophets will come, claiming to be him, the historic Jesus, and that they will say the time is near. What time is that? Could it be Judgment Day? The Bible is prophesying a very similar thing to what the Muslim writings speak of, that Esau will claim to be the real Jesus, but obviously he won't be, he will be a Muslim. He will deny that Jesus ever was divine and ever died on a cross. He will claim to only be a prophet, not the son of God. If he does arise, he will likely be the false prophet. Revelation 13 may also refer to this man. Now the beast comes out of the sea, the Gentile nations, while the false prophet comes out of a land, which is likely Israel. And the false prophet has two horns, which might be the houses of Judah and Israel. We also see he looks like a lamb, which would be the lamb of God, yet he speaks like Satan. This seems like a perfect fit with Esau, who will claim to be Jesus and an Israelite. After the rise of this evil character, Jesus warns us about wars and disturbances, which include rebellions and fighting in the streets. Are a portion of these disturbances the jihad that the false prophet may be inciting? Jesus says not to be frightened by it. The reason he warns us is that this will be a frightening thing. Imagine 1.5 billion Muslims worldwide all rising as one in jihad. Are these among those the little horn rewards? Perhaps they are. And is this one way the little horn weakens the nations? Perhaps. Worldwide riots would all but shut down economic production and lead to famine, just as the Bible also predicts. Is it at this point, after the consolidating of his kingdom and the weakening of the nations, that the world reaches the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel? Let's see what else happens at the midpoint. First, we see that Daniel 8 tells us that the stars of heaven fall to the earth. Is this the same event as Revelation 12, 9? And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
It is likely at the same time the little horn takes over the temple, as we read about in Daniel 8, 11 through 12. As we can see, he exalts himself over Jesus, the commander of the host, and ends the sacrifice in the temple. This is, of course, the same event as seen in Daniel 9, 27. For half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. This same abomination or transgression of desolation is also mentioned in Daniel 11.31. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Jesus mentions this as well in Matthew 24.15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, Matthew 24, 15. And Paul mentions this sign as well in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. It is the single most important sign of the end times. Paul is clear that this is the revealing of the man of sin. Although Daniel indicates a lot of signs about the little horn, we can't really be sure if he is the beast until he sits in the temple of God. Yet many ask, how can a Muslim receive worship? How can he exalt himself above all gods, including his own? This is a great question that needs to be answered. The Bible makes it clear that the little horn and the beast demon and Satan will only seek worship for themselves. So in my opinion, the Islamic religion is only a vehicle for the Antichrist and Isa, a vehicle to get them to this point. Once they are at this point, the abomination of desolation, things may change. You see, Islam allows a prophet to change the religion. Yes, you heard me correctly, change it and add to it. Now the problem with that is Muhammad is the last of the prophets. They call him the seal of the prophets and they allow no more. But Isa supposedly was a prophet before Muhammad. Will he be allowed to declare the little horn to be God on earth? Allah on earth to the Muslims? In this way, will he fulfill Daniel 11.37? He will show no regard for the God of his fathers. No longer will he worship Allah if he claims to be him in the flesh. So that answers the Muslim question. But what about the Jews? How will they accept him? The beast's purpose is to receive worship that is due God and take it for himself and Satan. Revelation 13 tells us there are four means that the beast uses to receive this worship. This is a crucial, crucial, crucial point. The beast does not receive worship because he is deemed to be worthy, worthy to be the Messiah of Israel, as many claim, that somehow Jews will accept him. This is inaccurate. He receives worship out of deception and fear. In fact, in John 5.43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So Jesus came in his Father's name, Yehovah, as the Jewish Messiah. The Antichrist will come in his own name, not as a Jewish Messiah. Coming in the Father's name also means that Jesus fulfilled the Father's requirements for a Messiah. The Antichrist comes not fulfilling those things and not in the name of the God of Israel. The Jews will worship the little horn, not necessarily accept him, because of the four means he uses to receive worship. The first of the four means is by deception, by signs and wonders performed by the false prophet. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs, 
so that he even makes fire comes down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Revelation 13, 12 through 13. Jesus referred to these signs and tells us that they will be incredibly convincing. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24, 24. Those who see with their eyes and not with faith will be completely overcome by these signs. The second means is the Antichrist's ability to wage war. They worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? Revelation 13.4 Well, why is this? Remember, Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 tell us the Antichrist is empowered by a demonic beast to wage war. The world will recognize the supernatural in his victories. He will win when he shouldn't. And they'll worship him because of this supernatural aspect of his military exploits. The third means by which the beast gains worship is economic. The false prophet implements the mark of the beast. He provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. Revelation 13, 17. No one will be able to participate in the world system of commerce without taking the beast's mark. Those who are unprepared for this and unwilling to go off the grid at that point will worship the beast to get what they need. Food, houses, cars, jobs, everything. And the final means the Antichrist uses to receive worship will be out of fear of death. And it was given to him, the false prophet, to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many who, is who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Revelation 13, 15. So the dwellers of the earth will make an evil image of the beast and it will be given breath and will speak, and those who don't worship the image will be killed. So the career of the little horn will center on receiving worship by these four means. Deception by false signs and wonders, supernatural military victories, economic control, and fear of death if people don't worship him. All people groups and religions are susceptible to these things. The little horn's ethnic identity can't be determined solely by his gaining worship from this group or that group. He will gain worship from all of them. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Revelation 13, 7 through 8. Finally, though, as we learned in Daniel 7, the court will sit and judgment will be passed in favor of the saints. And as we read in Daniel 8, he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Daniel 8.25, Jesus will break the little horn, destroy the kingdom, kill the little horn, and throw the demon in the lake of fire. Wow, Daniel 7 was a pretty incredible ride, wasn't it? But in our next video, we will discuss the prophecy Satan feared so much that he tried to prevent it from even being communicated. Until then, this is Nelson with the Gospel in the End Times.